Hi, welcome to Harbour Midweek Minis. I'm Mark and I'm going to be doing three sessions on living in God's presence. And the background behind me is all of Alice's studio because I couldn't find a place where I could make a decent recording. So, thank you Alice. Um, in this video we're going to look back at, look at the Old Testament and um, see what it says about living in God's presence. And in the second part, maybe next week, we'll look at what Jesus says and in the third part we'll look at what the New Testament letters say. Um, in each video I'm hoping to explore the Bible and also bring something practical out of it. Way back in February, before COVID-19 hit us and before lockdown became the new norm, I spoke at the Sunday meeting about living in God's presence. I could never have imagined that uh, we wouldn't be able to meet together. Um, I miss our noisy, vibrant worship, I miss our chatty meetings. I miss meeting you guys. And in this time of lockdown, God's got us in a place where actually we're not dependent anymore. We don't have the lively fellowship and the worship to actually help us get along through the week. So whoever we're locked down with, remember this, primarily you're locked down with God. Don't miss the things he wants to teach you during this season. Back in February, I said I was going to try an experiment on myself, and it was very simply this. Could I deliberately bring my thoughts back to God repeatedly throughout the day? I'll say it again. Could I deliberately bring my thoughts back to God repeatedly throughout the day? At confession time, I failed, mostly anyway. There have been some wonderful times, a few of them, where I really made that connection with God throughout the day and it has changed the whole way my life worked during those times but most of the time I've been preoccupied with stuff even in this season where supposedly life is simpler because you don't have work doesn't really quite apply to me because we're a small holding which means to say the animals and the land and all that sort of stuff and the building work still carries on um, just with added complications about where do you get the feed stuffs, where do you get the building materials from. Anyway, when I've managed to wrestle my thoughts back to God, it's changed my whole experience. As I said, I'm a small holder, which means to say that we've got plenty of things to do. A few weeks ago, I was mucking the fields with our small tractor and small muck spreader. And they're really not quite up to the job. They're a bit too small for... The work I'm trying to do with them. So they repeatedly break down. Last year was such a miserable experience that you'd find me repeatedly up in the field kicking the tractor tires just out of sheer frustration. This year was completely different. Thankfully this was one of the times when I was managed to keep my focus, my thoughts returning to God. And this time it meant to say that actually when the tractor broke down or the muck spreader jammed yet again, actually, I felt peaceful and calm about it. And because I was in that better frame of mind, I was able to see, or maybe it was even God, was able to show me what was wrong and how to best fix it. So there's a real positive out of pushing through and trying to focus your attention on God, trying to remember all the good things about him. So if we know, if I know that it's much better doing it with God, why? Why, why, why do I allow myself to be distracted? Why do we allow ourselves to be worried by all sorts of stuff? And that brings us to the very heart of the human problem. The very first time we come across a reference to being in God's presence is right there in humanity's first sin. Genesis 3, verses 1 to 8. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of the tr every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. For, and the serpent said to the woman, 
you shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eye, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband, and he ate. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together to make a covering for themselves. And here's the key point. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So we see the first human beings running and hiding from God because they knew they'd done something wrong. This first sin hardwired something into us as a species. We run away from God's presence rather than into his presence. All driven by our deep desire to be independent of God, not dependent on him. Verse 5 has it there. That thing, you know, to be like God and to know good from e and evil. That's right at the heart. All of us hide from God's presence in some way or another. And this is the battleground we find ourselves on when we try to deliberately bring our thoughts and our focus towards God repeated, <laughs> repeatedly throughout the day. It's a hard fight but one well worth engaging in. The uh, word for presence used in Genesis 3.8 is panim. It means face. Roger's already spoken about this. And the next time, or not the next time, but we've come across this same word in Genesis 32.22 to onwards. It's that weird story of Jacob having a wrestling match with this mysterious man by a brook. Anyway, here it is, Genesis 32, verses 22 onwards. Jacob arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over to the ford of Jabok. He took them and sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had with them. Then Jacob was left, left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the man said to Jacob, What is your name? And Jacob said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me what your name is. And he said, Why is it you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face. And my life has been preserved. Oops, here we go, it's just jumped. Just as he crossed over the pineal, the sun rose on him and he lipped on his hip. Roger spoke on this passage, as I said, um, some time back, and he's written a great article that can be found on our webpage. Webpage is www.theharbourchurch.co.uk. Look under the article section and you'll find a thing in there called Jacob at the Jebok. And you'll come across in there this same thing. Panim el panim, face to face, being in the very presence of God. Jacob fought and wrestled. He was injured and God blessed him. There is real blessing when we win, when we wrestle and we win with deliberately focusing our thoughts on God. We can experience his presence, his face, his panim. Psalm 46, verses 6 to 10, again from the New King James Version, says, The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. He's made desolations of the whole earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He broke, breaks the bow, bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots in fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. This psalm tells us that in the middle of a global crisis, in this case it was war, nations fighting against nation. In our case, it's this global pandemic. Normal is no longer normal. But in the middle of this, this writer of the Psalms says very clearly, we can still know God. And Jesus and God says now, be still and know that I am God. The great news also is from this psalm, is that actually if God can make war cease to the ends of the earth, he can also ease that battle in us and give us the desire to seek his presence, to bend our thoughts, to bring them to our thoughts to God throughout the day. So God says to us now, be still and know that I am God. So, how about trying it yourself? Try having that wrestling match. Try bending your thoughts, bringing your thoughts repeatedly back to God throughout the day. And see what an impact it has on the disasters that we always face at some point throughout our day or our week. Next time, we're going to look at what Jesus says about God's presence. It'll be good to know what you think of this video. If you have any questions, bang a comment on that YouTube thing at the bottom somewhere there. See you soon.